before it would take a miracle to. And sometimes that miracle happens. The anecdotes I've described in this book have been tragic and triumphant, heartwarming and heroic. They involve ordinary people, the child next door, the man along the road, the stranger in the supermarket, who had possibly never given the idea of miracles a thought before they experienced one. Even though their stories won't have provided the skeptics with any answers, they may have prompted some questions about the unseen influence on our lives. Is it arrogant to suppose that we have total control over our destinies? Or are there miracles out there waiting to happen to any of us? After total immersion in miracles for several months, while I researched and wrote this book, I'm convinced there are. Published by John Blank at £9.99, It's a Miracle, was written by Irene Thompson. Irene, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. On 1089 and 1053 AM and DAB Digital Radio, Talk Sport. Right. Going to be talking to Mick in just a minute. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that if you open your morning paper today, or what well, starts at the front page, as most of us do, you'll notice that quite a lot of the uh, larger papers are featuring a story about drink, booze, and the claim that it's going to be limited for younger drivers. It must be reduced. Because Britain has the highest drink drive uh, limit in Western Europe, four times as high as the, uh, the high limit in Sweden. And the government has been pushed into responding and it's been told by its own drugs advisors to cut the alcohol limit for young drivers to curb the growing numbers of drink drive deaths on Britain's roads. It's a very influential advisory council that's been involved on drugs and related substances demanded that the limit be reduced from 80 milligrams to 50 of alcohol per 100 millilitres of blood. OK, so let's be sensible for a minute. If you give somebody a glass with some water in it and it's about half full and you say to them, how much is that? They're gonna, it's an arbitrary guess, isn't it? So here's, here's what I suggest. I suggest if you're below a certain age and let that age be 21, just for argument's sake, you're not allowed to drink and drive at all. Alternatively, you might want to take away permission to drink and drive whatever your age. Give it a thought. Give it a thought. Because alcohol is the most pernicious drug. If they were starting to introduce alcohol all over for the first time, do you think they'd get away with it? 08704 2020. 08704 2020. Let's talk to Nick. Hello, Nick. Oh, press the button, Michael. There we are. Do magic work, kid. <laughs> I'm so pleased James Well had a bit of a problem with his computer this earlier today. Oh, got it now. Hello, Mick. Hello there. Hello. Sorry about that. It's, I think we, we had so many calls to speak to Daniel Stratford, everything's still steaming. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, it's just uh, about, you know, you're on about miracles. Yes. This might sound a little daft, but uh, I got back home once. I'd been to uh, Iraq with a truck and I went on my way back. And I had that many problems, and I was a little lad, he had that many problems coming back. And uh, we've been into Romania, and we froze up a few times, and uh, I was coming back through the fuel line. And uh, I was coming back then through uh, Germany, and it was very cold. And it was that cold, the, the fuel started to turn again. And uh, I would, this time, I'd been away six weeks, and normally the journey only took three weeks. And... As I'm coming through Germany, I'm going uphill and it starts to chug and I thought, oh God, no, it's going to stop. I'm going to end up with the fuel, uh, you know, problems again. And I went, oh dear God, please don't let this happen to me. I mean, I, I felt really down because I had a really bad trip. So, oh, dear God, please don't let this happen to me again. And all of a sudden, it picked up. Now, there's no kid in here. I, it picked up. I never had a problem all the way home. And see, when I got home, I... I just went, this is 25 years ago, and uh, I went in to my wife, who was dead now, God bless her, but I said, uh, do you know what happened? And I told her, and uh, to me, it was a miracle. I just can't understand how it happened. Extraordinary, isn't it? Stuff comes like that, and it catches you, and you're just left-footed. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just that, uh, 
you know, people say, oh, it's just coincidence, but to me, I thought, once your fuel starts to go like that, it starts to go like jelly. Um, there's no way, you know, it's, it's just gonna, he's gonna stop. And it cleared up, I had no problem from there all the way on. And I've often wondered about it, and see when you were talking about miracles, I thought there's different kinds of miracles, you know, you could have health problems and whatnot. And, yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Just a silly thing like that, diesel, and you go, dear God, please. Because I really did feel really down. And w that was it. That's I don't want to... Miracle. Well, I, I did want to embarrass you, Mick, but would you say that you would... Did you go to church regularly before that happened? Uh, yeah, yeah, I used to go, uh... Well, when I was at home, I'd be there, I'd, uh, I've got a mass on a Sunday. Right. And, uh, I used to go if I was, uh, near a chapel, when I, I used to do Italy, well, I still do Italy. Uh, if I stood on a Sunday and there was a chapel near, I could get to, I'd, I'd go into it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm not really what you call a, a right religious man. I'm a Celtic man, by the way, and I thought they did brilliant tonight. Well, they looked good, didn't they? Looked good on our plasma screens, I tell you, it was very nice. <laughs> Interesting story on the front page of the Daily Mail this morning. Families of British soldiers killed in Iraq are banned from demonstrating outside Labour conference. Their response is, why can't we protest over our dead sons? We could be talking about that. I'd love to hear from you. My number's 08704 202020. 08704 202020. I'm Mike Allen. Your thoughts, please. On 1089 and 1053 AM. The most deeply held principles around the world. Not kneeling on our knees. Around the clock. It was never meant to be negotiation. From the Sky News Centre. Talk sport on the hour news. The top stories from the Sky News Centre at three. 1089 and 1053 AM. Talk Sport. Tony Blair blasted Britain's NATO allies uh, yesterday and they had a, a duty, he said, a solemn sworn duty to send more troops to Afghanistan. He blasted Europe's big guns after they failed to commit extra soldiers in tackling the Taliban. France, Germany and Italy refused to back the 5,000 UK troops fighting in lawless Helmen province. Commanders on the ground, backed by NATO chief Jacques de Hoop Schaeffer, have urgently demanded 2,500 more troops. They also need more helicopters and equipment. But after a NATO meeting in Brussels yesterday, spokesman James Appleby said that no formal offers were made. The Prime Minister said that it was of fundamental importance to global security to secure victory. He insisted it is important that the whole of NATO regards this as their responsibility. The British forces are making their contribution. They're inflicting real damage on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. So we're talking about France, Germany and Italy refusing to back a claim that we need more troops. Got 5,000 troops out there. We need another 2,500. So, should we just do a little bit of blame spreading here? After all, who said, oh, that'll be enough from the outset? 5,000 will do it. Uninformed. Bad call. Or should or could this decision affect the way the British people see our relationship in the common market? us going in and doing all the dirty work and the rest of them sitting back and saying OK, we're with you boys until turned upon for support where are they? Where is France? Where's Germany and Italy? When it comes to actually doing something oh, they're standing back it does make you wonder what is the point of NATO? What is the point of the European Union? What is the point of swearing allegiance to look after others all for one and one for all? Doesn't seem, doesn't seem to be following through, does it? So I ask you, whatever your feelings about the Prime Minister, this isn't really about him. This is really about Britain as a nation and our neighbours, our neighbours who take millions of squids off of us every year as our contribution to the European Union budget. We're taking lots of people from other countries around an expanded European Union. Is there any payback on this? Is there any support? Is there any... Please, thank you very much. Come and knock on our door. We'll give you some support. Doesn't appear to be, does there? 
or am I being totally unreasonable? My number's 08704 20 20 20, or you can text me on 81089, or email talksport.net. When it comes to Afghanistan, are we going to have to do this on our own? And if yes is the probable answer, how will this affect the way we see our relationship in the European Union cap, happy family? <laughs> I was going to call them campers, but I thought, no, it might be too true. Have a think about it, but pick up the phone and give me your thoughts. 08704 20 20 20. We're looking at a situation here which could change how we sit with the rest of Europe. It might be the Prime Minister's stopping you from making a decision because you don't really want to go along with anything he says. Well, that's not really the sharp end of the, the conversation this morning. What is the sharp end of the conversation is we've gone in and done something about it. And everybody else is standing well back as if it wasn't on their conscious thought pattern that it could possibly do anything other than be left to the Brits to look after the whole problem. Stuart's in Stanmore. Hello, Stuart. You what? really 194 hours since we last spoke? 194 hours? Or minutes? Or, t or 1,152 minutes? 194. Two <laughs> See, I remember all these things. Yes, how are you? I'm okay. Uh, so, I see, so you've got Christian Dion tomorrow, have you? No, no, not in this lifetime. Uh, just Daniel Sanford, you just out. <laughs> He'll be back next week. Right, I see, you, you um, oh, I suppose we can put up with one hour of the altar gang. You put up with one hour of what? I suppose... It's not as if you're, uh, you haven't turned into a full, full show of your, of all your little old gang and group. Oh yeah, no, no, and then I've got no intention of, do, of doing so. Uh, I just, um, because I've done it and, and it was groundbreaking and now other people are copying it. Of course, but you were the original. <laughs> just as you're the original Michael John Allen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Europe. Okay, so Europe. So we're, we're talking about uh, which about Germany, Italy, and France, who agreed way back in the day to be giving their best support, and their best support at the moment is nothing. Just as they, just as we've given nothing to a fight in Iraq, just as they've, just as the French had to have their arms twisted, literally after after they promised that they changed their minds to lead the peacekeeping force in Lebanon. Yes, that was another example of French joie de vivre. Just as Saddam Hussein went to Jack Chirac's wedding. Hmm. Unfortunately, the French are only, have only got the interest in dominating the EU when it suits them along with the Germans. Do you suspect it might, that they might be afraid to take a stand because there are so many um, North Africans, Moroccans and what have you, that fall under the banner of former French colony? Yes, that, that you can understand, but the French and the Germans have been at the forefront of greater EU unity and wanting common defence policies, common foreign policies then when you've got a chance to act under a NATO banner and under a joint banner, these people are nowhere to be seen. And it seems to me that it's, this has got a familiar ring about it, you know. Uh, you look back through history to the, uh, the First World War and the Second World War, and uh, the French came second on both counts, and we were there doing our bit fighting on their behalf, and, and also for our own interests. That's why, that's why I've always said, we've got far more in common with America than we have with these European countries. And that is why the biggest mistake Margaret Thatcher made in her political career was the Channel Tunnel Agreement to bring us closer to the French. Yes, it's a shame actually they haven't got a time warp drive 
we could go the other way. Unfortunately, my friends, you go back to uh, the Vichy and uh, how they gave in to the Germans. Yes, uh, well, the, the Vichy France didn't even fight, did it? It just went belly up and they just moved, just drove That's in. True. And you know that the French and Germans have reciprocal arrangements where they sit in each other's cabinet meetings. Then before, when they speak up for each other and back each other at European summits. Because yes. they've already... They've agreed already... Beforehand. They've talked the deal out. Yes. Exactly. Yes. I just find... Because this Taliban uprising will be dealt with. It will. It has to be dealt with. Because if, it, if we don't, we've just stored up a lot more trouble. We can't we walk away from it. It has to be dealt with. We cannot walk away from terrorism. If, you, if we walk away from Afghanistan, we have to walk away from Iraq. If we walk away from Iraq, we can never hold our heads up again as a major player in the world. In fact, even as a minor player in the world, let alone a major player. So let's go to the second part of this observation today. Do you believe that the end of this altercation that we're going through at the moment, whether it be, um, well, probably Afghanistan, this is really where the story is centred. Do you believe we will see Europe through the same eyes after this? Whoever is Prime Minister? No. We will see our European allies as a bunch of craven, hypocritical cowards who let us down in our moments of need and have refused to back their fellow European and NATO countries up when the help was asked for. They have so refused to, to go along with anything. They have refused to back a United Nations peacekeeping force. Despite they have refused to back a NATO force. Despite pledging their support. Exactly. It's not the French, enough. once again, have been shown to be the biggest liars. After all, you had Chirac himself, uh, uh, Chirac and his Prime Minister both said completely different things about Lebanon. I think... Where the French are supposedly the ones with the contacts in the Middle East and able to speak to the Arab side of things. I suspect they're probably afraid of what might happen to their own country if they take a stand. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. 08704 20 20 20 or text 81089 or www.talksport.net. I'm Mike Allen. Good morning. We'll be speaking to Frank in just a minute. Talksport, the radio station where men are men and sheep can sure run fast. Talksport. It's nearly 18 minutes after 3 o'clock. I'm Mike Allen. Frank's called me. He's in Manchester. Hello, Frank. Good morning. Good morning, Mike. Yeah, um, can I just say first off, well, you know, I've got a very clear, mellow, soothing voice you've got. And I better thought of making a record, you know, for these people, like, a relaxation tape record, like. <laughs> I, no, thought, really. I thought you were phoning up to complain, to say I sent you to sleep. No, no, just saying you've got a really, you know, soothing voice, but you know, when it, by the way, Hastings is bad, I'm not gay. Um, yeah, now then, you're talking about this. First of all, I was really annoyed when I heard this, um, the polls are saying the English are lazy. They're really? Lazy. They, they're saying they're lazy. They're, they're fighting the work. I don't. The I polls. Don't. Yeah, I heard it this morning actually. The polls. Oh, oh no, I don't. I don't doubt you, you did, but I don't believe that they're lazy. No, it's a, it's it's a, it's a, it's a bad. Maybe it's, you know I don't know you know how many said it like what percentages, but it's not. The only is you're going to get that every nation you're going to have lazy people you know. Well, you know, for them to go into over this country and say it, if indeed it's true, it's not, it's not a very nice thing to say. Well, you can, you can have a bad army, but the truth of the matter is it's bad because it's improperly led. Mm. So I think, I think if we are a little behind what people's great expectations are, I'd suggest, Frank, it's probably because we got the wrong management team in and people are probably saying he's talking about the government again. Now, it wasn't a, 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 a swipe or a side swipe at the government. It's just an observation on, you know, I think the British people are very industrious. Can I just say something else, Mike? Please do. It's, um, I'm a bit frightened about this European market, the way it's going, you know. It's, um, 
We're talking about, well, some, some years ago, we're talking about letting um, Turkey in. Yes. Now, I've heard, like, you know, that a lot of Turks don't really want to come join it. You know, and I really hope they don't join it, to be quite honest with you. Because it's one of the biggest Muslim countries in the Middle East. Well, you know, any any 3% of it is in Europe. Uh, but there's another thing, you know, and it, you know what um, I'm saying, you know, it's for frightens me. And, um, and the, uh, the other thing to think about, though, is that um, their very moderate Islamic administration, well, but, well but compared to their neighbours, they are moderate. Yeah. Um, but also the huge amount of oil pipeline that's coming into Turkey and comes up to the Turkish coast for, you know, moving it off offshore onto mm. the tankers. So that's coming out of, uh, from Russia, that uh, pipeline which terminates in Turkey. So that's going to make it a very important supply, especially as Russia seems to be uh, moving on up the price of its gas. Do you mean to say, like, um It'd be a good thing for us in in, in that sense, like oil wise. Well, I, I so suspect. To let, to uh, let Turkey in. I suspect there will be a lean on us to let Turkey in, yeah. Mm. And that lean will be the fact that uh, interest rates are soon to go up, according to a lot of people. And in addition to that, we have a situation, as we were saying last night on the program, that if you put up the price of fuel, whether it be for vehicles, or for oil heating at home, whatever you put a pr put the price up, everything goes up anyway because well, everything relies on fuel either to move it to sell it, or even just to take us into work. Well, that's yeah, that is a fact. And the other thing, like some about Bulgaria and Romania coming in, I think you know when we first joined, I thought it was going to be about six or eight countries, you know, you know European countries. I thought oh, it seems okay, like on the face of it. Well, it's 20 odd now. It's going to be like 25 or something like that. I'll tell you one thing that always made me smile when they used, everyone used to watch the Eurovision Song Contest and they and, and Israel used to take part. How can they be part of the Eurovision Song Contest? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I suppose it, anything can happen if you want it to. Yeah. It's good to talk to you, Frank. Thanks for the call. Uh, if you'd like to be part of the programme, love to talk to you. What are your thoughts on what's going on at the moment? It's 08704. 2020 08704-2020. Or give us a text. You can't beat a good texting, can you? On 81089 or talksport.net. Do you know, George, I think we might have to have a cup of coffee. I don't know if you're up for a bit of that. I think you might be right, yeah. yeah I I'll, think I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll I'm get feeling, on the case. I'm feeling <laughs> the, the inclination to wilt. I such a, I, I, actually, since I last saw you, which is what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Uh, I think it's more like three weeks, isn't it? Yeah, it was yeah. a little while ago. Okay. Yeah, it's been so busy. Really? Yeah, unrelenting, unrelenting. Yeah. And the other day, one of the boys from the breakfast show, Alan Brazil's breakfast show, said to me, uh, do you do a bit of this voiceover work, Dan? So I said, yeah. <laughs> You've got an agent, have you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First thing people do when they find out we work in that's their radio or television, you know. Yeah. Can I get in there and do a bit of that? What about yeah. some of this acting then, Helen Mirren? Yes, yeah, my exactly, sister. Yeah. My, my sister can do that. She looks a bit like the Queen. Well, you see, the real professionals make it look so easy that everyone thinks they can do it too. All right, I'll make the tea. <laughs> <laughs> Rob's a Rangers fan and is in Ipswich. Hello, Rob. Hi, there, mate. How are you doing? I'm, I'm dead right. proud to be British, mate. Yeah, d d I tell you something, you know, th this is just emotion speaking when I say this, and, and what you've just said. I, yes. If they're not, if, they're, if the French and the Italians and the Germans aren't going to keep their word, okay, we'll do it. But after we've done it, I think we have to look to the whole operation to be funded by the people who were too bloody shit scared to finish the job. Exactly, mate, and if you go back decades and, and what Britain stands for and what we've done, for other countries running about the world, you, you should be proud in what they're doing. And, and what Tony Blair has actually done over like, Iraq, Afghanistan, is, is, is good. It's good what he's done. And I stand by what he's done. Well, if you don't take a stance against terror and terrorist activities, 
how can you possibly hold your head up? Exactly. exactly. I mean, in 1991, I went out to uh, former Yugoslavia, Croatia, on, a, on an aid mission. And I've seen firsthand just what wars are all about from uh, an aid mission point of view. And it's bloody frightening when you see people and their legs are blown off and stuff like that and they're grateful for it and if countries like us just stood back and let that happen how, how, do, how do you feel? Oh, it's, it's very easy to criticise and I'd be amongst the first to say the way the Iraq invasion uh, was carried out was bit shabby bit shabby mm. they really didn't give it enough planning I, yeah. I mean... I, can I just float this past you? Because I thought about this in the bath soon after I heard the news about how it was going in Iraq. The idea the Americans had was that they would be welcomed by the Iraqi people and they'd throw garlands around their neck and right, fake yeah. them, yeah. And then we had, what was it, five days of shock and awe mm. bombing and missiles. So there's no way they're going to come rushing out of the hole that was once their house to say thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and the reason why they'll not do that though is because the only, the only mistake that what we have made over the last sort of a 10 to 15 years was we never finished it the first time round. Yes. They pulled out far too early and, and we lost the respect and we lost what the Iraqis had towards us for coming in to try and help them out the first time round and we left them, basically, in the poo. Right, we've, we've, we've done so far, we never got rid of Saddam the first time round. This no. time round, well, we this, have done. This was the third invasion of Iraq, wasn't it? Mm. The third invasion of Iraq. Yeah. And, and I tell you what's even more unacceptable than what we've just talked about it's the fact that having done it on two previous occasions they had such a lack of awareness to get it wrong the third time exactly exactly that exactly that and the other thing that does sort of wind me up and i would like to hear your view on it is they're bringing saddam to trial right they can't find mr taliban man he, he just he's it disappears into the, the, the mountains. The Russians couldn't cope in Afghanistan, and that's pretty frightening when you when you sort of think of that. But the Saddam thing where they're bringing him to trial, that's going to turn out a complete farce and cost the taxpayer absolutely billions of pounds. Oh, that's what sure. winds me up. Yeah, well, it. I suppose in one of those situations, Rob, where justice has to be seen to be done, it has to be overly courteous. I mean, you, you, you think he, um, Slobodov, uh, uh, what's his Milosevic. name? Milosevic, Milosevic. That's him, right? You, you think of how, how long he's been kept in the Hague, trying to fight his own case, trying to be his own solicitor. Hmm. He's got a, I think it's a heart condition, isn't it? Hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he's been in trial for about the last eight, nine years now. And it's, it's a joke. Whereas I think, personally, it's not probably right, it's, it's probably quite wrong. Do exactly to their people what they've done to the hundreds of thousands, what they've done themselves. But then, but then when you think about um, the former Yugoslavia, possibly taking a very hard line with him and saying, mm -hmm. right, I don't mess about, you know, you're going to mm -hmm. go into court tomorrow and you're going to answer the questions, or if you don't, we'll take you outside and shoot you. Yeah. Now, what might that instigate in former Yugoslavia? Because that's an uneasy truce there at the moment, you know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, when I went in here and it was blown in bits, of the, uh, it, it was still a beautiful country. And it is a beautiful country and they're, they're, they're doing pretty well at the moment. But as you rightly said, it is still very, very unstable there and always will be. Any country, I think, that's is going to go into a a civil war predicament hmm. is always going to be unstable. It's what, what we say about the Germans. Will we ever be able to trust the Germans 100%? The answer to that is no. Yeah. I personally think. It's what the Italians, who are their alliance really 100% with? I, we'll think never the, ever I think the Italians, I think their, their, their greatest uh, loyalty lies with the Italians. You know, the French, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. The Fra I think the French and the Germans see they have common interests and it suits them because, as an earlier caller was saying, you know, it's the, the strategic voting that they do between them mm -hmm. often carves up decision making. And, and then we go on to the Dutch. What, what do they ever do? Oh, they, they just grow stuff in polytunnels. Exactly. <laughs> and, and we go around all these European countries that were meant to be trying to be one, right? And then we come back to the argument that we hopefully are, are rightly talking about on your show about the Yanks. I love the Yankees. I think the Yanks are great purely because they stand up for what they believe is right. And yes, they, they they do. I mean, they're they're not subtle. If they like you, they like you. And if you if you cross them, maybe that's something that they get from us. You know, they they let you know you upset them. And and I, I listen I listen to talk sport a lot. I listen to radio too and the Jeremy Vine show a lot and stuff like that. I'm a truck driver, so I like to sort of find out what's going on in that. And and I, and I hear people sort of slating the Yanks every day or George Bush this and the Yanks this and. They're going gun ho and stuff like that. I personally just think they stand up for.